So Jan McDonald has been treating eating disorders and body image issues in Brantford for 13 years. She's worked in three treatment centers and hospitals in CT on eating disorder units and programs, working closely with nutritionists, medical doctors, and medication specialists since 1993. A licensed professional counselor for 20 years, yoga instructor for 20 years, and a certified eating disorder specialist, Gina hopes to bring you some understanding of the complexities of eating disorders and body image disturbance. Gina's book, To Mind Your Own Body, a body image handbook, is here at the Blackstone and available for purchase through her website, gina-mcdonald.com. So please welcome Gina McDonald. Thank you. So uh, we were very surprised to see that uh, 100 people signed up to enter and then we are unable to take on more people. So if anyone is not here, they will be able to have access to a recording. Well, that's the good news. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming and attending. This is an important topic and I appreciate you being here. I first and foremost want to thank the Blackstone Memorial Library. These are the people, the friends of the library, the board of trustees and the staff that have made this facility available and opened its doors after all the reconstruction they did and trying to open the doors and now opening their doors during the COVID virus. So specifically Karen Jensen, who I met with in January, not knowing we would be doing virtual, and also who you just met, Jenna Anthony. She is actually the program coordinator, but she has become the audio engineer. She has been taking care of all of the Zoom work and all of the complications and believe me, She's a busy person, it's very hard. So thank you, Jenna. I also want to go back into the archives a little, back to 2006 when I first came to the Blackstone and I met the, at that time, program coordinator whose name was Kate, I believe, Hosfeld. And Kate, I asked, can I speak on eating disorders? Would you let me? And she said, you know, this topic is very dear to me because I lost a high school classmate to an eating disorder here in Connecticut. So yes, I did come and speak at that time. I think I've seen some of you before here. And also um, I want to say that I was able to bring in panels of people who had never met before because I had worked down at Hartford Hospital and I had worked down at Greenwich where the Renfrew Center is. And in between, I knew about the Yale Child's Unit and I wanted to unite people. And so I brought them together as panelists to speak about their experiences and their knowledge. A year later, facilities started opening in Connecticut, which was great news down in Windsor Locks, the um, Walden Behavioral Care, and then they opened in Guilford, which is on the shoreline, great right here. And then we have Center for Discovery that opened its doors down in Fairfield County. So then I brought in these people from all these facilities to speak. And yes, again, the James Blackstone Memorial Library was here to help people connect. You have been a bridge that has helped connect people for this cause. And I want to thank you so much. At one time here at the library, I invited all of these facilities to bring a client who could speak on recovery. There was one person that impressed me and I want to share about him. He was in high school and he passed out on the football field. He had lost weight, he was exhausted, dehydrated. They didn't know why. The coach would never have thought that a football player would have an eating disorder. He did, and he was able to get treatment and come and share his story, looking magnificent. <laughs> he did share one piece that was a little touching he talked about how his dad had a hard time accepting his son would have an eating disorder, his son, the football player. And so he and his dad had a period of separation and detachment while he decided to go into treatment and get help. This points out the stigma and the bias that exists with eating disorders regarding gender. These days we know that many men receive treatment and need treatment. We also know that eating disorders crosses into all colors, all people of colors, all religions, all socioeconomic backgrounds, all 
sizes. We know this. We have seen the faces of eating disorder change. Um, so again, I want to thank the Blackstone for bringing this about and helping us. I'm going to share with you a little information about what's called the National Eating Disorder Association. Reason being, the National Eating Disorder Association is the largest nonprofit organization dedicated to supporting individuals and families affected by eating disorders. We know in the United States, 20 million women and 10 million men who suffer and will suffer from an eating disorder at some point in their life. Eating disorders are serious, but treatable mental and physical illnesses that can affect people of all genders, ages, races, religions, ethnicities, sexual orientation, body shapes, and weights. In fact, eating disorders has the second highest mortality rate of all mental health illnesses, surpassed only by opioids. It used to be the highest, but since opioids, it is not. And we know the pain and the losses that go along with both of these illnesses. So Nita is here with a mission to support individuals and families affected by eating disorders. They have a hotline. They are there to answer any calls. They exist in Hartford, and they've actually been here to the library to speak. And they also have their main headquarters in New York City. They have uh, Nita Walks which are gatherings every year where all the people who have experienced recovery or are working toward recovery come with the hope and the uh, courage to celebrate and to support each other. They also have, um, they're nonprofit, by the way, so they need us and they have membership. So anyone who wants to get on board, please do join them. Down in New York, they have a gala event every year to get their money. And this year it was canceled. I was fortunate to go to a few, and I have to say they're wonderful. I, uh, doctors receive awards and clinicians who contribute to this field, and I was able to witness Margot Main, who received the well-deserved award for eating disorders excellence. And also Patrick Kennedy received an award because it was Patrick who helped us get in the healthcare systems treatment for mental health equivalent to treatment for physical health through his Parity Act. So aside from the National Eating Disorder, I just want to put in a little comment or two about the International Association of Eating Disorder Professionals. They are specialists. They were established in 1985, and they are well recognized for excellence in providing fine quality education and high level training standards to us as clinicians all of us who treat the various um, spectrums, all the spectrum of eating disorders. They offer a highly respected certification process for those who wish to receive this credential. It is rigorous. They have core courses that are involved and they also require uh, 2,000 hours of training with supervision. So, so someone goes to graduate school and after graduate school, they do their um, postgraduate work to receive their license. So they do like 20, uh, I'm sorry, 2000 hours of uh, supervision and experience, and then they get licensed. After they are licensed, then they begin to accrue 2000 more hours supervised working with eating disorders. They can receive it at the work site or there are specialists, I am one of them, there are not many in Connecticut, who will help them with their certification to submit and receive. So bravo, brava to IADEPT. Guess what? Good news. We have a chapter here in Connecticut, our own New Haven Hartford IADEPT chapter. And we have a fearless leader, Emily Rhyme Ifrak. And as soon as I heard that she wanted to be the president, I jumped on board and became vice president. She's so dynamic and energetic, and she's so savvy with computers and creative, and she has a great pulse on what we need and what's going on. And what we are now experiencing is that on our board and in our IADEP chapter, we do not have enough representation of people of color. We do not have enough representation of people of size or of people of genders. 
we open our doors to people who wish to join. You do not have to be credentialed. You can be from any walk of life because we need you to help us understand what we can do better. So we open our doors and we are looking all the time. We need diversity. Um, I'm going to take a moment now just to pause. I want to talk about what we all know, COVID, COVID-19 and the COVID fatigue. So it's real. And this actually gives us a chance to understand the clients, the people suffering with eating disorders, because they always feel uncertain. They are not certain of who to trust and what to trust, just as we are now with all the information we have coming in, trying to keep up with it. They too are struggling with the voice of an eating disorder that is pulling them in and promising them what they think is going to give them love and happiness. And then there's us over here, parents and therapists, pulling them this way and saying, no, but you want your health. No, but you want recovery. And they don't know what to think and they don't know what to believe in. They're spinning around. So we now get a taste of what it's like for them. It's actually even more difficult for them. And my heart goes out to them, especially the college students who may not be returning to the time of their life when they are meant to create their identity, their individuation and relationships. Okay, so we have this COVID fatigue. There's this new concept that came from an, another eating disorder specialist. It is called radical self-care. Right now, I'm going to ask you to participate in a simple experiential task. You do not have to, it's totally up to you. But I am going to ask that if you wish to, you take a moment, you can close your eyes or soften your eyes, look downward or focus on something. I'm going to ask that you feel your feet connected to the earth beneath you, whether you are seated, standing, or lying down. And feel the energy from your core going down through your legs into your feet, into the earth, helping you feel grounded and rooted. As you deepen, begin now to lengthen up through your spine, lifting up through your midline, all the way up, opening your heart through the neck to the top of your head. From the crown of your head, lift up toward the heavens. We are lifting upward, we are rooting downward. We are balanced. And now I ask that you take a moment and follow the breath in through your nose to the back of your throat. And from the back of the throat with a hissing sound of ha. And follow another breath as it comes flowing in like a wave, filling you up. And follow the breath as it leaves you, the wave leaving. And once again, we find the breath coming in, inside, filling us up. And we're going to stay inside now, even as we exhale. And staying inside, you find this place you can call home, center, whatever you wish. As you now feel this place within, bring your dominant hand, right or left, to this heart. And feel your breath coming in and the heartbeat together. the sensations of your being. And while you are here, take a moment to find an intention, an intention for yourself or for someone else. Do not censor, let it come, notice it. And now repeat to yourself, my intention is, and fill in the blank. And add now, my intention is, this is my intention.
We let this be, we give it space to exist. And don't worry, feelings may come up, that's okay, let them be as well. And we slowly now begin to open the eyes if they're closed, keeping this place within, connecting to us, and opening the eyes, coming back to this group. Connection is the key word for my presentation. Connecting within, during the COVID, we have opportunities to do this. And staying connected without, even though there's social distancing, perhaps it's physical distancing, not social distancing. So let us begin now, now that we've hopefully had a little rejuvenation here, let us begin with some of the important information about eating disorders. So, unfortunately, some of these are a little challenging to absorb. Eating disorders are serious conditions that can have a profound mental and physical impact, including death. Every 52 minutes, someone dies of an eating disorder. This should not discourage anyone struggling as recovery is real and treatment is available. Eating disorders have the second highest mortality rate of all mental health disorders surpassed only by opioid addiction. We know that eating disorders used to be in first place and now it's opioid and we know the great losses that go along with this. We know that there's comorbidity with eating disorders. We have anxiety often, excessive worry, depression, sometimes mood disorders, obsessive compulsive disorders or thinking, bipolar disorders. All of the people who are trained to work with eating disorders are trained in these areas as well. Substance abuse is very common. In fact, up to 35% of individuals who abuse or were dependent on alcohol and other drugs have also had eating disorders a rate of 11 times greater than the general population. 50, up to 50% of individuals with eating disorders abuse illicit drugs or alcohols. So we know that things are complicated. We know that eating disorders have biopsychosocial pieces. Dr. Margot Main, my mentor and old boss, and Doug Bunnell, who I worked with as well, another expert, have a book on treating eating disorders, and they talk about the perfect biopsychosocial storm. We have genetics, we have interpersonal relationships, we have um, mood disorders, we have uh, personality, we have traits such as perfectionism, low self-esteem. Um, all of these pieces come together in a perfect storm. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the symptoms of an eating disorder. In general, behaviors and attitudes that indicate weight loss, dieting, and control of foods are becoming primary concerns. Preoccupation with weight, food calories, carbohydrates, fat grams, and dieting also. Refusal to eat certain foods, progressing to restriction, restriction against whole groups of foods. They may appear uncomfortable eating around others, and there may be rituals with foods. There may be skipping of meals or taking smaller portions. Any new practices with foods or fad diets, including cutting out specific entire food groups, such as sugar or carbs, dairy. It's tricky when someone is a vegetarian or, has vegan, or is practicing veganism. It's very challenging. There's frequent dieting. We know that these things are tricky and we know that these are symptoms. There may be a fear of gaining weight as well, and always extreme checking themselves in the mirror. So I'm going to talk about a little bit about each, each eating disorder, but don't worry about diagnosing. You want to leave that to the expert. It's a little tricky and there are nuances for every person and every clinical decision is made based on the specifics of that individual's case. I am first going to talk about binge eating disorder. It has been in the diagnostic manual for six years. Why wasn't it there before? I suspect because of the bias and the stigma attached to weight and obesity. These are people that have been shamed and taught to diet 
and excluded from normal daily activities. These are people that were possibly put on diet pills. These are people that were named and called names in school. These are people that suffer. I have groups for women in their 50s and 60s who have struggled with obesity and have been through surgeries. I have to tell you, they are the most caring women I have ever met. They know what pain is about. They know what it's like to have needs. They know what it's like to want to be loved. And they work to help other people. They work with those disadvantaged. They work in education. They work in healthcare. They know from their own life not being properly cared for and loved what it's like because of the stigma of weight. Binge eating disorder has secret reoccurring episodes of binge eating. Quickly they eat in large quantities of food. There are oftentimes feelings of disgust and depression and guilt after overeating. Feelings of low self-esteem come into play. They may steal or hoard food and put it in strange places for, for embarrassment. Um, and they may create lifestyles um, and schedules to rituals like calling out, ordering food out for two when they're home alone. Um, lots of these tendencies can take place. I'm going to switch quickly over to anorexia nervosa, which you know more about. Um, anorexia nervosa, we know, you know, it's the poster child for eating disorders. And uh, we know that it shows dramatic weight loss. It has people dressing up in layers to hide their body. Um, there's a preoccupation with food and weight and calories, especially fat, and they make frequent comments about feeling fat or seeing them fat, some fat. There is a distortion, and they see themselves larger than they are, a perceptual distortion, and they have difficulty maintaining a healthy body weight, and they will not want to be in the normal body range. If you tell them they are looking good or looking healthy, uh -uh. That means they're in a normal, healthy range, and that is not going to be well taken. They will continue to lose weight. So just be careful of making comments. Um, so in addition, we have bulimia nervosa, and that's when people binge eat, but then they purge. They purge the food, and there are um, sometimes symptoms of this that occur, uh, whereby they leave food and wrappers and vomit, etc around and about. Um, trips to the bathroom are frequent after meals, and uh, they may drink excessive amounts of water after they purge to fill up. And water loading is very dangerous, by the way, because it can give them rainoids and other pro problems with potassium that can be life-threatening. Okay, so I do want to say there's a very interesting eating disorder called ARFID, Avoidant Restrictive Food Disorder. It is different than all of the others because they don't have the diet mentality. They don't have concerns about appearance. They don't have a desire to lose weight. They don't have an underlying is issues of, of low self-worth or shame, but they have this tactile and sensory difficulty with certain foods. And so they avoid certain foods and they're not low, they don't eat low calorie foods. They eat whatever foods they want that they can tolerate. Occupational therapists, have such insight into this because of their work with sensory integration. Um, so these people really need, unfortunately, they need to go to the same treatment programs as the others because they need meal plan supervision. They need to have food groups reintroduced to them because they're not getting variety and their weight is low and they may be uh, not getting adequate nutrition. Um, we remember that no one falls into a specific category. It's, always, it's not always that clean, clear. And, uh, so we have an eating disorder non-specific, non-specified eating disorder category so that we can put people into a place where they can get um, a diagnosis and get treatment. Okay, now I want to talk about the consequences, but guess what? I'm not going to. I'm not going to talk about the consequences of eating disorders. I've already given you a few. But we have COVID fatigue, and we already have too much information out there that is scary, and we don't need more. And sometimes we have to say enough. 
and walk away from the news. And sometimes we have to say enough. We don't need more. If you want the, that information about the consequences, you can go to NIDA, the National Eating Disorder. So I say that let's move on and talk about treatments. Throughout Connecticut, we have these programs that are opened. Bravo, Brava. Um, they all have different theoretical approaches and different models, not only for psychiatric care and intervention, but also for meal plan supervision. And they're all different. And believe me, I know because I've worked at all. So I like that. I think it's good that people can shop around and see what they want and go throughout the state to get what they need. We have residential programs. We have day treatment programs, intensive outpatient programs. They are all open. Some of them are virtual, but they're still doing a fascinating job. I'm very impressed with how they do the meal supervision online. It's very impressive. So each of them have their approaches. I am going to talk to you today about my approach. So. I'm going to share with you my three approaches. I use the mindfulness, which we did earlier, when we followed the breath in and followed the breath out and paid attention to our senses, our inner being. And I also use uh, CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and I use body image therapy, which is a new evolving therapy. I believe someday it will be like occupational therapy. Someday it will be, there are pioneers out there working to create one. It will be. So let's talk about cognitive behavioral therapy with my clients. So I want to help them recognize their styles of thinking. There are styles of thinking that are protective. They're a little bit twisted. They're all or nothing, black and white, catastrophic, perfectionistic, polarizing. I mean, we live right now with a present political climate that is very polarized. So this is going on everywhere, not just with them. But yes, in their head, they are doing a lot of these styles of thinking, believing that they need to protect themselves from feeling their deeper innermost feelings. So I help them recognize their styles of thinking and help them to reframe them and help them to find the middle ground. So for instance, if someone is doing the thinking of, I have to be thin, or I am disgusting, then in the middle, there's nothing. And we have to help them find something that they can begin to allow the possibility to tolerate in the middle. And if they think they have to be, you know, brilliant or they're stupid, we help them to see it's okay. It's okay that you didn't, you didn't get the 3.0, it's okay. <laughs> so we have to help them. These clients tend to be, oh, they're so smart and they try so hard. They have passion. Nothing wrong with that. They have high standards, perfectionism. It's not too bad either. And they have motivation, they're driven. None of these things are bad, but if they use them to the degree through which they're sabotaging themselves, then it doesn't help them. So if they're perfectionistic to the point where nothing is good enough, then they can't be okay with who they are. Meanwhile, they're wonderful, but they just cannot connect and access a way to see that just yet. So I help them with that. I'm going to give you a little example. So I had a client, have a client back in May during the COVID virus. She was working at, working at a hospital in the COVID unit. And she was telling me, Gina, I am exhausted. I am just exhausted and I can't stop saying it and no one wants to hear it. I go home and I say it to my kids. I say it to my husband. I say it to my mom. I say it at work. And everyone feels the same. No one wants to hear it. And I said to, I said to her, you're used to saying this and you're used to feeling it. So you have paved neural pathways in your brain that are well driven. In fact, the road is paved and there are one way signs saying, say it, think that. So she's gone that route of travel so frequently that it is automatic thinking and she's exhausted. So I'm not gonna tell her, oh, let's find a positive way of thinking here because she's exhausted. So I said to her, you are exhausted but I want you to try to add a little tag, a little ending 
so that the next time you say, I am exhausted, you add, because I am a hardworking, devoted nurse. Well, she went back to work and sure enough, someone else said, I'm exhausted. And she said, I'm exhausted too, because I'm a hardworking, devoted nurse. And they laughed and they replenished because they were reframing this feeling, this, this style of thinking. So she took a little detour off her neural pathway there, you know, and we can create new neural pathways, new ways of thinking. We just have to kind of work on it a little bit. So cognitive behavioral therapy is really important. My other primary therapy is body image therapy, which I use with my clients after I do eating disorder work. Sometimes I do my eating disorder assessment, and then I work on the body image component with them if they need it. I would say 90% of my clients have eating disorders and body image issues, and about 5% come to me strictly for body image issues. So I'm going to pull up now and enlarge my PowerPoint for you. And as you can see here, we have body image theory and application. So I say to my clients, what is body image? And they tell me because they know it is how I see myself. It is how I feel. And they are right. They are correct. Body image is that. Body image, as the scholars will tell us, past and present, it is a multi-dimensional phenomenon multi-layered feature of humanness. It's that piece of psychological space where body and mind come together. And as Adrian Ressler, a pioneer in body image therapy, will tell us, it is the picture in your mind's eye of how you see yourself, that mental representation. It is your perception of how you believe others see you, body concept, and how you experience living in your own body. And this is why we need to go back to the body to do the work. So the same person, Adrian Ressler, along with Susan Kleinman, a dance therapist, wrote a wonderful article called Bringing the Body Back into Body Image. And it is from the Embodiment and Eating Disorders Theory, Research, Prevention, and Treatment book that came out two years ago. And they state wonderfully, beautifully, it is clear that no winners emerge when an issue as complex and core to eating disorders, namely body image, is not fully explored. Practitioners must be able to use a variety of modalities delivered with enough clinical wisdom, empathy, and clinical intuition to form an authentic attachment. Relationship for healing. There is to date no known exact recipe for recovery. What we do know, however, is that leaving the body out of the ingredients needed for effective body image treatment leads to, and they quote Bruch, improvement that is apt to be only a temporary remission. This is why I believe I see clients repeatedly from one treatment program to another, to another, to my office, because the body image piece needs, they need to come back they need to get reconnected. So we're going to talk about um, the um, levels of body image because it is multi-leveled. So we know, my clients tell me, it's how I see myself and how I look in the mirror. Yes, it's visual, but it's also kinesthetic, derived from our internal sensations, how we feel in our body, proprioceptive, how we feel when we're moving. Some people feel bloated, some people tactile defensive, some people um, like cold, some people like hot, some people, our clients do not know fullness or, or hunger because they've cut off from this kinesthetic part. We need to bring them back to this. So thirdly, these are the lay, uh, layers of uh, levels of um, body image. Auditory we have, auditory is your self-talk. It's what we say inside to ourselves, and everyone has it. It's not that we're crazy, we're just dialoguing. But when the dialogue gets mean and harsh, overthinking and comparing oneself to others constantly, then that creates a dissatisfaction again. And emotional. Now, the first three came from Marsha Jermaine Hutchinson in her book, um, 
transforming body image. But this last one, emotional, I added because I kept seeing this in my practice. The emotional component is when the impact of all the experiences you may have had in your life regarding your body's function and your appearance. Parental guidance, social culture, environmental attitudes, the references made toward you. God forbid someone be bullied, harassed, stalked, or assaulted. These imprints are left. And I believe sometimes Sometimes we're, we're protecting, our clients are protecting and protecting and protecting from these parts of themselves that have been deeply buried and are hurt. Um, so we have to create a safe place. Now I'm going to jump into something else, very important. And this is gonna help us know how to help them connect. This is baby Ben. Isn't he cute? Baby Ben is full of tactile experiences. He does not differentiate internal space from external. He's got that little rug and he's got his tummy making sounds. His or her body, in this case his, is informed by movement as it is informed through movement. Moving indiscriminately before learning he has control of his body. My dance therapy teacher stressed this when we trained at Leslie College where I studied dance movement therapy. We know this boy has a sense of experiences from his, his sensations. We also know that it's pleasurable. This little guy does not realize, I think until he's about three months old, does not realize that things are moving, that things are moving. He thinks, he thinks things are moving he doesn't realize he's moving. It's not until he feels, oh, I do this and then stop, I feel this, and look, everything stops. And then I feel this, I do this, and I stop, and look, everything stops, and there's that face. And look, I can follow that person and stop, and they feel it, and they track and follow the person. And if the person is there consistently, they develop trust. So all of this stuff is going on through these earliest sensations of one's being. Now, we're going to move on because I have a couple more beautiful little people to share. These are the twins. As you can tell, Ruby is older than Nora. Ruby came home from the hospital two weeks before Nora. And look at what Ruby is doing to her sister Nora. She is fully aware of responding to her through nonverbal communication. It is called attunement. She is attached, there is an emotional bond to each other. This attunement to each other is vital. Throughout our lives, it helps us build and maintain our relationships, relationships to others, connection. Remember, that's my key word today. And Adrian Ressler, again, with Susan Kleinman tell us, Developing an attuned relationship promotes client insight, trust, validation, and connection to feelings. It embodies qualities inherent in a healing relationship. So, of course, you can't run home and hold someone's hand and, and get in their space if they don't want you in their space. But, hello, we can try to understand how another person feels. We can put aside what we think we feel and what we want them to feel and how we want them to go to school and how we want them to get good grades and how we want them. We can put aside our desires and stop our checklist of, oh, that's good, you did that. Oh, that's good. And instead of looking for what we expect to happen, we can find out what is going on inside. This is crucial. We have dance therapy and movement therapy tasks that help us to um, practice this body awareness and this kinesthetic awareness and this kinesthetic empathy, what Susan Kleinman calls kinesthetic empathy. Let's move on. I'm not going to be able to show you the video of baby Juniper, sorry, but I can tell you that she would be bouncing off the walls in her little movable stroller thing. 
So the body is the constant and a reference point here as they are growing for perception of objects. Without this point of refer reference, there can be no relationships. This is important because our clients forget that I am me and you are you. And they think they have to be responsible for your feelings and that you have to like them and that they have to become something you like. So we need to go back to this self versus non-self. And kids do it. They bounce into the wall and then, oh, there I go. And they bounce into the wall and then they turn around and they, oh, here. They find this way of organizing themselves in space and learning this. They are creating a cohesive mental representation at this time. Let's move on. They're seven years old. And here is Brody. Look at her. Little confident, huh? <laughs> Very engaging here. This is the time in her life when, you know, and the girl behind her, notice how she's a little pensive. Both of them, seven. This is the time in their life when they are beginning concrete operations, where they're beginning to be able to think abstractly. Their cognition is developing, their higher executive functions. So body image is no, not just about this feel good stuff, but it's also about how I think I look to others, how others see me, well, body concept, how you think you appear to others. I ask my adult clients, what is it you would like me to help you with the most? I would like you to help me with how I, how I look to others. <laughs> we have to help them with their body concept because they are thinking that they appear a certain way based on their subjective self and people are not seeing that. The objective fact is very different from the subjective experience. And based on those experiences they've had, which may have been painful, hurtful labels, they might have a negative tint on themselves. And they might tend to see themselves differently. And usually it's not positive because they get dissatisfaction, body image dissatisfaction. So, you know, remembering you can alter your body all you want. It's physical, objective fact but that's no guarantee of a positive body image. You have to work on learning to go back inside and reshape your attitudes towards yourself, which are based, of course, on body image, self-esteem, and self-worth. Okay, so moving on here. Um, I'm gonna go down here. Uh, so I mentioned body image dissatisfaction I think I mentioned distortion. They are both part of what we call body image disturbance. That strong dislike that a person has focusing on specific body parts comes, I do assessments. It comes from all the things we talked about, labeling, judging, ex experiences that one is personalized. Our clients are very sensitive people. It's a, again, it's a good thing, but it cannot be sometimes. Um, so we help them to learn how to see themselves more accurately. I do a distortion test. What's interesting is that 98% of the time, the level of dissatisfaction correlates with the level of distortion. So if it's mild dissatisfaction, they might have an inch of distortion. If it's moderate, they have two inches of distortion. If it's severe, they have three. And this happens frequently. So it proves to us that their inner experience of themselves leads to seeing themselves, I know it sounds crazy, but it leads to seeing themselves differently. Now, I want to talk about what is a healthy body image. Well, it's hard to obtain, but it is a generally when a person is satisfied with his or her body. They may have some experiences of dissatisfaction, but it does not interfere with their ability to feel good about themselves and to seek pleasure from the body, to engage in relationships. There's a capacity to be compassionate toward the body and adapt to bodily changes. Well, I mean, we're all getting a little older here, so we know this isn't easy stuff, but this is what it takes to have body, positive body image. The focus needs to be on health and how one feels rather than how one looks. These are two dance therapists and they say it well. Concern for outer appearance and internal aspects are balanced. So I tell my clients, the time you spend 
it's doing the outer work. You know, you get your nails done, you get your hair done, you look at, you know, pictures and of clothing. Go and spend as much time on your inner self. Go take meditation. Go take a meditation class. And a yoga class. But I had a client once tell me, I have to run out early. I'm going to yoga. I said, well, that's great. So why do you have to get there early? Well, I want to get in front. I said, oh, that's good. So you can hear the teacher. Oh, no, so I can look in the mirror. <laughs> now, yoga is about going inside, coming out. It's not about going outside and looking out to come in. You go inside and you integrate and you feel and you accrue the senses of balance, strength, flexibility. And then you find your core self, which is okay. And you learn that to judge it and to reaffirm it. So yeah, healthiness is not easy at these ages, older and younger. I have to talk about sports. Why? Because sports for some reason has a lot, oh, a lot of tendency to lead to eating disorders. And um, my screen is a little off here. I wanna see if I can pull it over. No, I can't. But we know that um, sports, are help, sports helps people. We know it does. It helps them build confidence, right? We know that um, sports can help people build self-esteem. Um, we know that um, people who are involved in competitive sports, now we're talking gymnastics, dance, running, track, skiing, they share a passion as well as a threat for a flawless performance, challenging their body image and their self-esteem. So here's where it gets a little tricky because perfectionism has its traits and elements in genetics, but it also can be acquired in certain environments that focus on standards of excellence. In my book, did I tell you I have a book? It's called Minding, <laughs> Mind Your Own Body. Anyway, in my book, I have all of what we've talked about and I'm going to share with you that why do people struggle with body image when they are excelling at sports? Or if, well, because sometimes they fail or they lose a game. If they're captain, they may take that personally. We know that body true, body image in athletes might respond in accordance to how strong their body image is to the sport knowing that it is linked, body image is linked to self-esteem, we can see how it's challenged in sports. Those with an intact body image are not likely to criticize themselves. Those with a less cohesive body image might say, this is a challenge for me to overcome. However, those struggling with a poor or negative body image can easily be at risk for body bashing and a resultant eating disorder because they think weight is the edge and if I can lower my weight I will be better compensating for feeling inadequate and what really happens is they lose weight they're not getting nutrition they're not functioning as well and they are as good as the, at the sport as they could be so tricky stuff I do have to tell you in this photograph this is um, my friend, my friend's daughter, who I'm friends with, and I saw her do this. She leaped over the Wesleyan pole vault and broke the record. Yes! All these guys are watching her. When I was her age, all the girls were watching the guys. Not anymore. I was so proud, but then I went away thinking, why do my clients suffer? So it made me ask these questions. It made me figure it out. Fortunately, if a person has self-esteem and self-confidence and self-worth, they can handle this stuff. But it's tricky out there. It's tricky. I know it looks great when we watch sports and we love the Olympics, but it is tricky stuff. Next, I move on to my yoga class. Now, um, I've gone and taken other classes before from good teachers. I think one of them is here today with us. But I have to tell you that um, I love teaching yoga. It's been 20 years. This class in this photo shows my group. This is two years ago. Everyone is 50 to 60 years old. And we have formed a community together. 
And in that community, I saw people come in with my friends. They came in with the pregnant, with child, and now those children are in college. And we went through things together. There's a architect, there's a, a teacher, there's a librarian, and there's a doctor over there who actually helped my loved one at, at Smilo. All these people come together to take care of themselves. I believe in yoga, and we know that yoga is associated with greater body satisfaction and fewer symptoms of eating disorders. We also know that when you incorporate the physical practice and philosophy of yoga into eating disorder treatment, that it provides a gestalt experiment in which clients can Im improve and integrate their awareness of what they are doing, feeling, and experiencing. So when someone does yoga and teaches it, it's great, but make certain that you're working from the inside out, kind of more like yoga therapy, because body image therapy is evolving. And I think that, you know, we have dance therapy in it and people have Feldenkrais and Alexander technique, but I think there's a place for yoga. As long as it's more therapeutic, um, you know, it's therapeutic use of movement. So that is it for me. I want to say that we're coming back full circle. We're coming all the way back to talking about the Blackstone Library connections. They connected me to you, and we are all connected. Spend time going inside, connecting to yourself, and helping your loved one connect to themselves, and honoring our abilities and our limitations both. It is time for questions, and our wonderful audio engineer, Jenna, is going to take questions from people. Please keep in mind, I ask that we not use numbers, weight, calories. I don't like numbers. <laughs> okay. Yeah, so if you guys have any questions, just go ahead and type them in the chat and I will pass them along to Gina. Okay. Someone said you were really great and thank you. <laughs> Anybody else? No questions? Doesn't look like it. You're very thorough. Um, usually there are questions. If some of these questions are personal, please text me. You can call my number, 203-710-6665. You can also go to my website if you want to buy my book. It's called Mind Your Own Body. It has everything we've talked about today in it. I think I've covered mostly everything I wanted to. Um, I do someone, want to. Someone has a question. Um, any comments about men and body image? Yes. Right. So what's interesting is I've had, you know, I've had state troopers come to me. I've had state troopers come to me. All men of all sizes and ages and varieties can come and have issues with food and body image. And I remember him telling me, "Well, I think I've done the whole spectrum of eating disorders. It's part of my weight." training body training thing but anyway you know we've got to stop this we've got to let go of the idea that it can only be a female problem because it's not 20 million women and 10 million men will suffer with an eating disorder at one point in their life so let's let's wake up to this fact and you know like i spoke of with the boy who who did his um who spoke on his recovery, and I talked about how hard it was for his dad to understand why he, the football player, would have an eating disorder. We have to let go of the ideas we have, and we have to learn about what's really going on. And I attended Nita Walks in the past, and there was a wonderful speaker, Doug Bunnell, does work with males and eating disorders. Doug is... If and Doug is around, he's down in uh, Fairfield. And Doug, um, Doug had a speaker come to this Nita uh, event. And um, does someone have their echo on? Someone have their mute? Oh, okay. so, I'm in a big room with echoes. So 
Doug had the speaker come and he was great. First he was at Wesleyan and he was doing the uh, crew, rowing. And one of, the, one of the rowing mates told him about purging. Keep your weight down, we'll go faster, we'll be better. So he practiced purging and he didn't, and he got good at it. Well, he, he, for some reason he switched over to Harvard. So then he went to Harvard and now he's on the Harvard crew team. And guess what? Somebody else there tells him about purging. So he does purging. And then he's addicted to the behavior because those neural pathways have been traveled for so long that way. And that behavior has become so much a part of their life. You know, it's so much a part of one's life that it's hard for them to think that they can possibly live without it. But he spoke about his courage to do this. And it was just a beautiful time, it was a beautiful moment for me to hear. Um, I, I enjoy having male climate clients. I enjoy all colors, genders. But I, I, it's a treat for me because it reminds me that we are all human. We all experience vulnerability. We all experience shame. We all experience anger, loneliness. It's human to feel these things. It's okay. It's okay. And so part of it is teaching men that because they're not used to talking that way and they haven't been brought up to talk that way. In fact, they might have been scolded for talking that way. And again, I'm stereotyping here a little bit, but we just want to be careful not to put people in a category and treat them differently. We are all similar, okay? All right, we have some other questions. Um, Someone says, I think I read somewhere that you use expressive arts therapy. Could you describe that process and how you use that with eating disorders? So the graduate program I attended, Leslie University, has, it's an umbrella. It offers art therapy. It offers movement, dance movement therapy, drama therapy, and I think music therapy. And while you're in your core, you're taking that as your primary focus. So the art therapist Art therapy will work to become an art therapist. Dance movement therapy will move on. They encouraged us to take from other modalities. So I did take some art therapy because I had an undergraduate degree in fine arts, a minor in psychology, and I wanted to do, you know, utilize that. I believed in it. My mother was an art teacher. I could see how it worked a little bit when just by her being an art teacher, I could see her bringing home stuff that kids would create. And I'd say, wow, that's cool. And she'd say, yeah, but the boy doesn't know it because he, you know, he got thrown into my art class because they couldn't handle him in the other class. And then they pulled him out before I could tell him how good it was. So I knew about this stuff. So I did take art therapy and I do use some art therapy techniques, but body image therapy, I believe, includes not just movement, but some art therapy techniques and somatic techniques and mindfulness techniques. Sometimes clients feel more comfortable making something concrete than going inside. I have a client now, she wanted to do body image therapy. And I said, great, I have this, um, I have this task that we can do together. It's a kinesthetic awareness task. And immediately she was like, no, 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 no. It was too much, can't go there, I'm not doing that. But she does incredible work when I give her a task, <laughs> a mask task for her to go to town and paint it you know, um, different things work for different people. Sometimes you have to go through one, you go through another. But I find that art therapy can be helpful. And I do say, I am not an art therapist. I do honor them and I do use their work with permission. And I also believe that it's very helpful with body image therapy. But again, you have to go inside the body. So if they're doing a drawing of how they perceive if they're doing a drawing such as this, this is one of my client's drawings, I give this contour and she filled it in, then this is a representation to her that expresses. And then after she does it, she talks about it. And then I can say, okay, wow, there's all this energy going on in your head or your arms or your womb. And then we can hone in and maybe get to talk about that and get into the sensations and feelings about that more. So it can be a good um, entrance way. So um, I do recommend going to 
expressive therapy schools and getting your degree before you use art therapy or movement therapy or drama therapy. My supervisor, dance therapist, had me go back and do disclaimers in my book to make sure that people didn't use some of the tasks that I was talking about unless they had the training. Mistakes can happen. I had a client, I was doing a movement group at a site um, while well, I was doing body image work. I said, let's do some body scanning. Out the door she goes, whoop. And I liked her, I wanted her in the group. <laughs> she was a good facilitator. So later on I said, why did you leave the group? She said, I did a body scanning task at another place. And boy, it was not good. And then when she told me the place, I knew the place and I knew they didn't have a dance or a movement therapist or a body image therapist. So it was a nutritionist that did it because she was filling in. They didn't have, they didn't take, they didn't hire the right, the right person to do it. So you shouldn't be doing body image therapy and calling it, your students shouldn't be doing stuff and calling it body image therapy unless you're following the pioneers and learning the work because it can be dangerous. Even when I do it, the clients have a half problem with it. Yeah, it's tough. So be careful. Okay, I'm gonna combine these two questions so they're kind of related. Um, any suggestions for someone who sees restricting symptoms in a loved one, but that doesn't, that person doesn't seem ready to change? And how can you encourage an ED person to communicate with family members? So the first part of that, what do you do with someone who's restricting? Mm -hmm. And they're not wanting to talk about it? They, doesn't, they don't seem ready to change. And the second part, again? Um, and how do you encourage an ED person to communicate with family members? They are connected, yes. Thank you. Oh, dear. It's a great question. Um, so boundaries are very important. I believe eating disorders are about boundaries, and they're about relationships, because relationships are about boundaries as well. And our clients uh, are protective. You know, they have this place that they have feelings about and they're not always ready to talk about it. And it's theirs, it's their body. So we can't, we can't sometimes be intrusive and tell them that they, they need to talk about it. I mean, it's helpful to ask them how they are doing, how they are feeling, if they're okay, what's going on, but not to bombard them or certainly not to um, helicopter follow them or, um, you know, stalk them. It's just important to give them space. Now, they are going to resist because they are practicing autonomy, and that's important for them to learn and feel that. So if they can get to a clinician, a therapist, and by the way, a nutritionist, who needs also to be a nutritionist, not someone from the gym with a year of training, not someone from who's naturopath or a chiropractor, someone who's got a college education and is an RD and has eating disorder help, then maybe they can begin to look at the things that are going on. It could be safer sometimes for them to go to a nutritionist to talk about food than to come to a therapist. But eventually a good nutritionist will connect them to a therapist. So yeah, it's very tricky. We try to honor their abilities and their limitations and we also try to honor our own. Um, I hope that answers the question. If you need to text me or contact me for more info, please do. Gina, do you mind if I put your, um, your phone number in the chat so people can write it down if they need to? Go right ahead. Okay, and that's 7106665? Okay, all right, so that's in the chat. Um, and the next one, was, do you have any suggestions for working with someone who has diabulimia? So they restrict their insulin to avoid gaining weight. Yes, believe it or not, that is true. And I'm glad you brought that up because I did not mention that. I can tell you that the Walden Behavioral Care located in Guilford, Connecticut, understands this diagnosis and has a, they create tracks to treat people for specific things. So I would recommend going to the Walden Behavioral Care to get help with that specific problem. There are also nutritionists. I know a few that are wonderful that have the expertise 
but it's a very scary thing. So, um, yeah, it goes to show you how, how people can get pulled in to um, feeling desperate. Okay, next one is, can you speak about your experience working with teens living in group homes? How do untrained staff address ED issues with residents and what is the best, me best method to document what they are seeing for TX providers? So um, I have worked in different programs and one had an adolescent unit, the other they were all included, um, adolescents and adults back then. Um, so um, this is going back to, you know, 1994. Um, but on the adolescent unit I worked at more recently, um, I have to tell you, this is a great, I think these adolescents are really, really astute. <laughs> and I learn so much from them. And I just go in and I ask them and I hear and listen and give them, then they ask me and it's an open dialogue. They, um, Oh, they, if you give them an opportunity and you have them together, they can do the work. We don't have to do the work sometimes in a group because that's the beauty of a group. Because once we open the topic or the task or the dialogue, they can exchange. And just last night in a small group I have, one person gave the other person information that she needed to hear. This is magical. It's meant to be. They can help each other in ways. They're not going to take it from us all the time. They're not going to hear it from us. We're older, three times their age, right? So I, I believe that groups are powerful. And I this specific task, for instance, right in front of us, it's not, this is not from the adolescent unit, but adolescents went to town on this task. Um, let me just pull up the other one right here. This is a task, same thing. I give them the contour. The person in blue writes down, oh, I'm sorry, the person in black ink writes down what they think and see and feel about their eyes and their tummy and their legs and their heart and their legs, and then passes it to the person in the blue ink, and the person in the blue ink gives them feedback. And then they pass it to the person in the pink ink, and that person gives their feedback. And then they pass it to the person in the green ink. And when it comes back to them after being through pink, green, and blue, and down through black again, they get to get feedback from other people. And they really get an opportunity to see how different it is what other people experience of them versus their own subjective experience. And that's powerful for them. So these are tasks, you know, there are tasks that can be done, and um, there are ways to work with adolescents on treatment units. Um, I would be creative as possible, try to get an art therapist in there if you can, <laughs> try to get a, a movement therapist in there again, try to get a drama therapist in there again if you can, that would be really good. Drama therapy with adolescents is woo, very, very, very effective. Okay, next question. Have you found any correlation between PTSD treatment and body image therapy? So, when a person has PTSD, they have been traumatized and it could be repeated, of course. So, um, they have a disconnect. Of course, they're disconnecting from their sensations and the memories. It's very different than someone that has a negative idea of themselves and judges themselves harshly but there's still a disconnect because when people are doing the negative thinking, they're internalizing an ideal. So they're disconnecting from themselves to internalize what they think they wanna be. And their self-evaluation is down here and there's a disconnect. And they learn to, they need to let go of this unrealistic internalized idea and to improve their self. When a person has PTSD or trauma, they need a trauma specialist. Because connecting, you know, I don't know if I, in body image groups need to be specifically for trauma clients and then for clients that want to be there. I don't think everyone should be in a body image group. I've learned that. Um, but they are disconnecting because of the intensity. 
And so they need a specialist, maybe an IFS, internal family system specialist, or a trauma specialist, someone that does um, Marsha Lenihan's work and knows it well, DBT, dialectical behavioral therapy. But they need someone who's really skilled in helping them peel away and go into these places that are so scary for them. Okay, this is the last question we have right now, unless anybody else has one they want to type in. Um, when is it time to get a child professional help for their body image dissatisfaction? Um, is it better, or is it better to not make a big deal out of it and just continue trying to be supportive as parents, encourage healthy viewpoint, um, et cetera? A great question. Preventative is the best. And you know, the national eating disorder that I spoke of, I just got an email today hearing that they are offering a, a program, a, a training for parents to help with their children do this, this positive body image. So yeah, I mean, so you remember I showed you the photograph of the girl when she was seven, she was developing body concept, how we think we appear to others. Well, at the same time she's seven developing that higher executive skill and realizing people are looking at me and I guess I look a certain way and I guess there's a way to look. She's also getting bombarded by social media messages. She's getting photographs of breasts in her face, photographs of butts in her face, and photograph of genital parts put in her face. How, do, how does one know what to do with that information? They don't. And because our society insists on using these you know, platforms and these websites sometimes to endorse these things, um, hello, it's been going on for, for decades, but now more so. Because they get away with it, these girls are just confused and who can blame them? So I think preventative is the way to go. In my book, I list a couple of places. Actually, I think I have them here on my uh, screen. Yeah, I think I have one here. Um, and let's see, there's uh, clinics around positive body, a model formed in 2018. It can help with training clinicians to do work with body image problems. It's a, actually a, a training for therapists. Um, go to NIDA. Go and find out from NIDA what they offer because they can give you the tools to maybe begin doing this. There are a bunch of these people who have contributed to body image therapy um, and all of them know how important it is for children to begin with an idea that they're okay and they don't have to be over sexualized or objectified. I just, you know, the websites that used to be for anorexia and bulimia were once run by girls who would show their ribs and tell you what techniques for purging and hiding it. They're not run by girls anymore. They are run by men, the same men who run the porn websites who don't even know what they're doing. They don't even know. And the, fortunately, the clients are catching on to it, but that's how sad it, it is. You know, things are out of control when it comes to, you know, social, social um, networking. I think, I'm not sure, do the benefits outweigh, you know, the, the problems? I'm not sure. We'll find out more. But we do know that they need help at a younger age. And uh, body concept starts when they get those higher executive skills and they start thinking there's a certain way to look. So that's the point when you can remind them that, you are you inside and that's your brand of self and beauty and that's how you feel about yourself. You know, that's the place to be inside, confident. Okay, we got some more questions. Um, what should you say instead of praise when supervising an ED patient who is eating a meal? I'm sorry, what would you say to praise? Instead of praise. For a client who is doing what or? Uh, when supervising an ED patient who is eating a meal. Well, people are trained in, in meal supervision. Uh, 
I did that at a few hospital settings, but I'm, I have to say it's changed now. And I think there are better people that are trained to do it who are working in the facilities than I would. But, you know, um, distraction is a good thing. Sometimes you can have conversations about other things other than food. You don't always want to talk about food in front of people that are struggling with food. And you don't want people to be gawking and looking at each other. You know, and that's common sometimes at a table when clients are eating with others and they're checking to see how much they eat so they'll eat less because there's a little competitiveness with that. Um, so I, I would be very careful not to, I would not say, you know, that's really good you ate that because look out for them. They have broken a rule by eating that. They have broken a commandment and they feel already ashamed about that. And they're going to go back in their head and deal with the consequences of getting blamed by that, by their eating disorder thinking. They will feel guilty alone about it later. So please try not to, you know, give too much in praise at the table. You can wait later on and say to them, I know that was difficult for you. And you were the one that, you know, you really, you really showed that you can decide for yourself what, what's right for you. And you can reinforce that they're choosing to do something that's good for them. But try not to say it's good or bad on your terms. Okay, I've got one more. Um, are people genetically predisposed to eating disorders? And do you have insights about the research on genetics and eating disorders? People are predisposed. Genetics is a big piece. And I would go to the book by Margot Main and Doug Bunnell. And I think McGilley, Beth McGilley wrote this book, Treatment of Eating Disorders. And you're going to find out there is the perfect storm that I spoke of that has a genetic piece. You know, um, genetics is a piece. There's the environment as well. And then, you know, there's all these other things that come with aging and growing older and these influences. But you're not trapped just because of genetics. Um, you know, we still have the ability to make decisions for ourselves. One of the students at Wesleyan did this um, poet, piece of poetry, slam poetry, that won her a couple of awards and went viral. And she spoke about letting go of the um, messages that she got from her mother while she was um, growing up and living with her mother who would sneak downstairs to eat plain yoga. So, you know, you see the genetics. Um, I wish I could find it for you, but you see that genetics plays a role. And at some point people say no more. I'm not gonna carry on uh, just because it's um, a genetic piece. I'm not gonna follow, follow and continue to follow that path. Um, it's in my book. You can always buy the book and read the slam poetry. Her name is Lily uh, Myers. You can Google Lily Myers and see that poem. Um, so yes, I would definitely, that's a loaded question. It's a great question. I'm not the genetic expert, but please go to those that research it. Okay, that's all I have for questions, unless anybody has anything that they want to end on, but I think that covers it. Okay, then I'm gonna ask one more little tiny request. I'm going to just ask for another moment when people are lying down or seated or standing to again, if you can close your eyes or focus or look downward. And I'm going to ask that you take that breath in, following it through the nostrils to the back of your throat and from the back of the throat with the sound of ha as you exhale. And feel the breath coming in again, filling you up. And exhale, but stay inside this time and stay within this place called home within yourself. And now I'm going to ask you to take your dominant hand and place it on a part of yourself. Could be your heart or your throat, could be your forehead, any part. And let this part speak and give it a voice. So if this is your heart, you could say, this is my heart, and my heart says this. This is my heart, and my heart feels this. 
and see what comes up for you at this time, just noticing it without judging it. And recognize that we all have places within ourself, in our body, where we have feelings and experiences. And we can actually go to the body to learn from the body what it holds for us. And the body will tell us. Once again, repeating, this is my part, whatever part, and it feels. This is what I feel. And let it be, if you notice that you have other thoughts and feelings coming up, just notice that. And breathe in again as you tolerate those feelings. And exhale the sigh of relief, knowing that you have tolerated, you have experienced your feelings. They will come and go, and the breath will come and go. I thank you for coming now. I ask you to slowly open your eyes. And thank you so much for being here and being present. Bye. I'm closing out. <laughs>